What are your thoughts on the Junji Ito collection coming out next year? Do you have any expectations of it? I'm happy it's coming out. I think there's like a huge amount of potential for Junji Ito in anime. And if they nail it, if they do a good job with it, that could be potentially one of the best anime of the year. This was me four months ago, back when I still had hope, back when I still believed. And now the lauded Junji Ito anime adaptation, which I was so excited for, is nearing its conclusion and any hopes that I had have been dashed and dashed utterly. And now I, in my slightly older, angrier, crazier form, must account for the foolish optimism of my younger, stupider self. One thing I'd never accused Berserk 2017 of is being boring. While the show itself has all the grace and style of a bull covered in excrement rampaging through a Walmart, there was at least a morbid humour to be found through the laughable animation and bizarre sound design. Which I do appreciate on some level because the only thing worse to me than a piece of art being bad is one being mediocre. I think it's a lot better to be ridiculed than forgotten. And tragically, it's the stench of mediocrity that seeps from every forgettable frame of the Junji Ito collection. It's a show without life, identity, or soul, feeling more like a poorly done tracing of Ito's work than an actual adaptation of it. Generally, shows of this quality I don't usually talk about because why would I? I'd much rather make videos about things I'm actually passionate about. But it's here where the Junji Ito collection has forced my hand. As while the show itself is about as lifeless as a decaying corpse, the work it's based off most certainly is not. Junji Ito was born in the mountainous Gifu prefecture of Japan in 1963. He grew up in an old country townhouse where to get to the bathroom, he'd need to travel down through a pitch black underground hallway. And it was in the shadows of this tunnel that the young boy first became acquainted with fear. He became drawn to the works of the old masters of horror manga such as Umezo Kaozo, author of the violent and disturbing God's Left Hand, Devil's Right, and Koga Shinichi, whose work frequently centered around satanic worship and morbid depictions of the occult. Ido would take up drawing horror manga at an early age and eventually grow to develop his own unique brand of horror. And if I was to put a name on it, I would call it inescapable horror. Situations where people encounter entities completely beyond comprehension or reason. Malevolent forces that cannot be understood, fought or escaped. And frequently, that malevolent force is a person's own body. Many of Ito's work focus on the degradation and corruption of the human form. And to me, that is one of the purest and most visceral kinds of horror. No matter how terrifying or dangerous an external threat is, there's always the chance of escape. But when that threat is our own arms, legs and organs, that chance of escape is taken away from us, as the very flesh of what we are distorts and turns against us. As explored in titles like Slug Girl, Glycericide and of course Uzumaki. It's creative and disturbing concepts like this that permeate Ito's work. But what's critical is his ability to bring those concepts to life through the medium of manga and illustration. We talked a lot in our How Media Scares Us video about Ito's use of the page turn, how he'll place a little anticipation panel right down the bottom of a page that lets us know something very bad is coming, and then we slowly turn the page and blah, fuck that. But the other part of what makes these page turns so effective is also Ito's greatest strength, his ability to create imagery that is genuinely terrifying. Watching Ido draw is mesmerizing. It's not unusual for him to spend up to nine hours on a single page, creating lines with slow, careful strokes and gradually layering his illustrations with intense, intricate details, often making tiny adjustments the average reader would never consciously notice. But this is important, as to Ito, nothing is more vital in a piece of horror than it being believable. No matter how wild or unfathomable the concepts he's depicting are, 
it's critical to him that it feel like something that could actually exist. And to me, this is the line between something being merely scary and something being truly horrifying that intangible element of believability. And this is the strength of Ido's illustrations. The detail and care he puts into them mean they have a way of creeping into your subconscious and whispering maybe, just maybe, they could be real. This is what I really respect about Ito as a creator. There's an earnestness to his work, a genuine lifelong love and respect for horror, honed and refined over years of craft embodied in his manga. This is what makes the idea of a Junji Ito anime adaptation so exciting. The prospect of seeing these stories realised with light, sound and movement, which could not only have made for a unique and compelling anime, but even greatly benefit the genre of horror itself, and in particular, horror in animation. I've always felt that animation carries a potential to deliver horror in a way that's woefully unfulfilled. There's the occasional standout both in terms of films and series, but generally the best examples of animated horror I could find were a little off the beaten track in forms of animated shorts or music videos, which I will probably talk about again at some point because some of this stuff is genuinely incredible. But regardless, the thought of Junji Ito's work finally being realized with that potential was an exciting one, and on paper, it should have worked. What we have here is a 12-part animated series that translates 24 of Junji Ito's single chapter stories into animated shorts, and the story selection is reasonably solid. Fashion Model, Window Next Door, Town Without Streets, these are some of Ito's strongest and most interesting work, and what's more, they've been translated with a near slavish devotion. Watch any episode of the series and compare it to the corresponding manga chapter, and it lines up more or less identically. Direct Directly borrowing shot composition, staging, posing, and story beats, to the point that you could even say it's a highly faithful adaptation. But it's here where the issues begin. I want to show you this scene from the Junji Ito collection, and ask yourself, what information can you draw from this shot? Who are these people, and what is their relationship, and what is happening in the story? The answer is that this is our main character, Sakyo, and this is the moment when she's realized that the people who have been spying on her throughout the story is her own family. But you probably got no sense of that because the shot doesn't convey even the vaguest feeling that there is anything remotely wrong here. Now, let's check out this same moment in the manga, and look at how the subtle paneling, and in particular, the staging of the bottom panel evoke this how these subtle close-ups of the top panel lead us to Sakyo's realization, and how the composition of the bottom panel cements that feeling, using forced perspective to make Sakyo feel tiny and helpless, while surrounding her with the large imposing figures of her father and brother, creating a tense, oppressive moment in the story. But the anime adaptation hasn't retained any of that, flattening out the composition and destroying the oppressive atmosphere. It's like all they saw here was a family having breakfast and that's what they translated, not grasping the subtleties that make this moment special. This is emblematic of the issues that plague the Junji Ito collection. It recreates the basic outline of Ito's work without understanding the meaning and mechanics behind them. The problem with the Junji Ito collection feels deeper than just a technical failure. There is here what feels like a core, nearly philosophical misunderstanding of how Ito's manga work and what makes them so frightening. Take the aspect of the page turn, for example. This is essentially Ito's signature move, but also not something that's going to translate smoothly into film. But at its core, it's a technique used to build anticipation. And building anticipation is something that horror cinema has been doing for years through sharp, creative editing. Creating tension through long, unbroken shots and instilling panic through quick, precise cuts. But instead of the edit being used to create any sense of rhythm or drama, what we get here instead is badly placed sloppy cuts, with shots that just lazily collapse into one another, meaning that sense of anticipation and build that's so important to Ido's work is nowhere to be found here. Possibly the most mishandled aspect of the entire production though, 
is the translation of Ito's greatest strength, his ability to terrify with a single image. One of my favourite instances of this comes from the story Window Next Door. It's the point in the story when our protagonist first sees the creature that's been calling out to him in the middle of the night, and it's a scene that's so critical because every scare that follows is reliant on the idea that whatever lives mere metres away is something dangerous and terrifying. And in the anime, it's... it's okay, it's kind of unsettling, but just look at this same panel from the manga. Look at the detail and work that's forged this moment. The grotesque rendering of the woman's skin, the stark use of black and white, the detail on her teeth, her jewellery and hair, and the life in her eyes and how it all comes together to create the uncanny feeling that she's actually staring back at you. By comparison, the anime version just feels flat and lifeless. The grotesque rendering around her skin has been replaced by a lazy texture overlay, which takes about 5 seconds if you know what you're doing in Photoshop. The level of detail around her jewellery, clothes and in particular eyes has been simplified to the point that the image no longer has that uncanny, nearly sentient feel. I could even accept the reduced level of quality if it was for the purpose of simplifying the animation process. But here's the thing, this image doesn't actually animate. All we get is a slow pull in on a still image, and it's the same for the rest of the episode. There's no shots of the creature actually animating, with the exception of two cut-off shots of the creature's hands. So why then is the imagery depicting it so weak? What possible value is there to a compromised version of the source material that doesn't even take advantage of the very reasons it's being compromised? What advantage is there to adapting something you're not even going to truly adapt? Let's talk for a moment about the nature of adaptation. One of the most exciting things about seeing your favourite manga adapted into anime is watching how the studios leverage the medium of animation to express the story in bold and exciting new ways. With the right staff and production environment, we can see elements of a story that build on or even surpass the original. Like take this scene from Hunter x Hunter, and look at how the animation of Boya Ling adds all these tiny, enraged, panicked little movements to Gon's posing that wouldn't really be possible through these still images of a manga, and it's scenes like this that make adaptations worthwhile. Not a one-to-one -one recreation of the source material, but the value that can be added with animation. And all the most successful adaptations work off this principle. The colour design of Jojo's Part 4, the insane camera moves of Mob Psycho 100, or the weighty, impactful animation and editing of Hajime no Ippo. What I appreciate about these shows is there's a real passion not only for the recreation of the source material, but a genuine adaptation of it. Cutting away the elements that could only work in manga, but in turn replacing them with those that could only work in film and animation. And to me, this is what an adaptation needs to be to be successful. As without leveraging the advantages of animation, all an anime adaptation can be is an inferior version of what already exists. And this is what the Junji Ito collection ends up being. Anything it even slightly succeeds at is done infinitely better in the manga. As opposed to the animation enhancing the story, it frequently takes away from it, with a quality oscillating between forgettably mediocre, with characters animated with stiff, unexpressive poses to the downright awful, with an animation that feels not only limited but completely rudimentary, and what's more, it's plagued with hosts of visual errors, like this shot from episode 1, which looks fine until you realise the entire bottom part of the character has been completely cropped off. And I have to ask, how was something like this allowed to broadcast on an international level? But this same level of consideration is in every part of the production. From the dull, uninspired background art which takes the harsh blacks and whites that carved out Ito's world and transforms them into a washed out mess of greyish green midtones, and continues right on through to the bland character art, which only feels vaguely tinged with Ito's seductively ethereal character work. The problem here isn't even that this show looks bad, it's that it doesn't look like anything. It's a limp, lifeless imitation of its source material that carries none of the heart or energy of the original. 
And that's what boils my blood with this show. When I think of the passion and life this author pours into every stroke of his manga, and seeing that passion maligned in a production that feels so cold, so lifeless and without purpose, one that seeks to emulate the surface level concepts of Ido's work without respecting any of the heart or craft that brought those concepts to life in the first place. Ultimately, I can only speculate about what happened here. Maybe the fault lies with Studio Dean, whose output has been on a sliding scale of quality for years, or perhaps it's the woefully inexperienced director Shinobu Tagashira, whose only previous directorial credits are a music video and 2013's Diabolic Lovers. But the feeling I get from the constant overall shoddiness of every aspect of this series' production is ultimately the same old story. At some point, a decision was made high up the production chain to not allow this project the resources it needed, be it staff, money, or time. And it was likely a decision made knowing that the fans would support this series regardless, purely by virtue that it had Junji Ito in the title. I don't take any pleasure in tearing this show apart. There was a time not long ago when I really wanted it to be good and was rooting for it to succeed. And I think a lot of people were, and that's what kills me about this project. To take something as terrible and horrifying and beautiful as Ido's work, and to turn it into something so painfully forgettable and mediocre. Something that no one will remember in a few years. A throwaway piece of media to be consumed and discarded. Friends, one final note to not end this video on too much of a downer, Junji Ito's Shiver recently released in hardback, and it's a far better way to spend your time if you're new to Ito's work. So if this video has piqued your interest at all, do track it down as it has 10 of Ito's stories that are some of his best. I want to thank you for joining me today, and in particular, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my beloved Wolfpack over on Patreon, who as ever support this channel and make videos like these possible. In particular, this week, I'd like to thank... Joel G, Cooper Jones, Phil Talio, Sarah Mordezini, Foxcade, Cogzuilla, and Monocle Giant. As ever, you can find me over on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast or on Twitter at iPatchWolf. Friends, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.